I'm Monty Mythe. Welcome to this, the latest in this series from the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine, specifically relating to issues regarding the novel virus COVID-19. In this particular episode, we're going to be dealing with hemodynamic management in COVID-19 patients. So I'm Monty Mython. I'm the Smith's Medical Professor of Anesthesia and Critical Care at University College London. As it says in my bio, which is a little bit out of date, I was on the College Council of the Royal College of Anesthetists and also the lead for perioperative medicine. I'm now the Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk. This webinar presents how the COVID-19 crisis is impacting countries in Europe. We have four experts to provide an overview of the current WHO treatment guidelines and explore using individual case reports the patient benefits of advanced hemodynamic monitoring in the ICU. I'll briefly introduce our experts and then we'll start with an update from the various countries represented in Europe. So we have Profe Professor Jacques Duranto, who's Professor and Head of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care at Bicetre University Hospital Paris and President of the Medical Committee of the Paris Saclay University Hospitals. Next, we have Antonio Messina. He's a researcher and senior consultant in intensive care at the unit of the Humanitas Research Hospital at Milan. His fields of interest include hemodynamic monitoring, heart-lung interaction, and perioperative medicine. Our final presenter is Dr. Manuel Ignacio Monge Garcia of the intensive care unit, Hospital Universitario del Sas Jerez de la Frontera, Spain. He's an ICU doctor mainly dedicated to hemodynamic monitoring and cardiovascular physiology applied to bedside monitoring. Apologies to all of my European co colleagues for my terrible pronunciation, but I've given it my best shot. Now, with regards to the program, we're going to start with the COVID situation in Europe from the point of view of getting an update from Italy, Spain, France, and then the UK. So we're going to start with Italy, Italy with a presentation from Antonio Messina. Antonio, over to you. Hello. Um, good evening, everybody, and thank you for hosting me. Uh, for me, of course, it's a pleasure to be here and to share my experience with uh, my colleagues uh, all over the world um, through this webinar. Uh, I'm a senior consultant in this uh, tertiary hospital, uh, the Mind Research Hospital, which is in the north of Italy, and more specifically Lombardy. Uh, Lombardy uh, as a, a region which has been particularly affected by COVID-19 uh, um, spread outbreak and basically we have seen uh, um, uh, exponential growth of these infections starting from the last uh, uh, the last week of February and the Italy has been locked down on 9 on, uh, of uh, March. Uh, basically Lombardy is a very dense region so uh, there's uh, roughly 10 million of people living here, which is 15 or uh, overall population, Italian population. And uh, uh, we had to create, we had to, uh, to set up a network of intensive care units uh, quite quickly uh, to organize a quick response and to uh, assess a contingency plan to improve our search capacity as the best we can. Um, considering the infections, uh, as you can see, uh, regarding the case rate fatality in Italy, these data have been updated two days ago. So basically, um, these data are quite consistent to other data all over the world. Um, the, the case fatality rate becomes quite high for, for those patients with a, a median age higher than 50 and much more for, the, for those with a median age higher than 60 uh, or 70. And considering the, the, the curve on the top panel, the red one, uh, this curve is related to the ICU admission, uh, admissions in Italy. And now we have, we have seen the first uh, inflection point uh, actually starting from the first week uh, of April. Uh, this is consistent also to uh, the admission in, in, uh, in hospital and uh, would increase the numbers of patients uh, which have been discharged uh, at home. So basically, the, the Italy is still locked down. Our government uh, uh, is discussing uh, regarding the possibility to reopen the, the country, uh, but we don't, still don't have any um, other information regarding that, probably during the first two or three weeks uh, uh, of May. Um, 
The last panel is related to how our experience with uh, these patients, uh, these data have been uh, updated yesterday. So in so far, we have treated uh, 105 patients. Uh, of these uh, 25, uh, 27, 25% uh, are still in ICU. And we have discharged 55, meaning uh, roughly 50% 50, uh, 50 of the patients have been already discharged um, to work or to home. And we have a, a fatality rate of the number of deaths, uh, which is roughly 22%. Uh, with a median age of uh, admission, uh, uh, which is roughly uh, 60. Uh, most of our patients are male, 80%. The median SOFA score of admission is 5, and the body mass index is uh, 28. Uh, basically, most of the patients we admitted were admitted just for uh, um, compromisation in the lung function. So, we didn't see uh, a lot of patients with the shock at the very beginning or with the other impairment in other organs in so far. So basically moderate to severe RDS in all of these patients. Thank you very much indeed for that uh, excellent update. Now, if you have questions, uh, please do save those for the end because we're going to go through our sequence of presentations and then come back to that towards the end. So our next update is from Spain. Uh, Ignacio, hi, thank you very much. Yeah. Welcome over to you for an update from Spain. Thank you, Monty. Spain fortunately shows a stabilization in the number of the of new cases of COVID-19 during the last week uh, with around 4,000 of new cases per day in the last days. Uh, we have around 200,000 of confirmed cases of COVID-19 infection so far. Unfortunately, the number of deaths is very high, more than 20,000 of deaths related to the COVID-19 infection. The positive news is the increasing number of recovered patients. So far, we have more than 80,000 of patients that have overcome this infection. <clears throat> and the estimated number of ICU beds during the last year was around 4,400. During the COVID crisis, the overall occupancy rate was around 75%, but this rate was heterogeneous and depended on the geographical zone. Madrid and Barcelona, for example, increased the occupancy rate of ICU beds more than 100. Our first confirmed patient was on February 1st. Still, the real increase was during the middle of March, with a progressive increase in the number of new cases on March 16 and 17. The Spanish government declared the official state of alarm on March 14 and the stop of non-essential activities on March 29. And the Spanish government has published recommendations for the prevention of the control of COVID infection, but also for the clinical management of these patients. These guidelines are available on the official web page of the Spanish government. But all other scientific societies, such as SEBISUC or SEDA, have also published their recommendation and have been working closely to develop a common strategy against this crisis. Thank you. That's it. Thank you very much indeed for that excellent update. We're now going to go to France to hear from Jacques de Grento. Jacques, welcome. Thank you. So uh, a great pleasure to be with you uh, for uh, this uh, webinar. So uh, just to share with you the situation in France and especially the situation in uh, Paris. So in France, uh, we have 117,000 cases and a very high uh, number of deaths, uh, 20, uh, 1,786 deaths and uh, we had uh, 5,433 patients in uh, ICU. Uh, initially uh, in France, uh, the higher uh, capacity of ICU bed was 5,000 and uh, during uh, the crisis, uh, we had uh, to increase uh, day by day the number 
of uh, ICU uh, beds, so we double the number of uh, ICU beds. In uh, Paris, uh, so uh, to be able to avoid uh, exceeding our ICU bed capacity, uh, we had to transfer patients, uh, more than uh, 250 patients were transferred outside of Paris in other area in France. And uh, this was done by train, uh, mostly by train. And uh, so, uh, and uh, we are the, in a very safe uh, condition. Uh, and uh, so uh, we uh, never uh, had the feeling that uh, our bed capacity uh, was uh, excelled. Uh, so it's a, it was a very good point during this very stressful crisis. Uh, so just to share some uh, data uh, uh, that we collect in a Parisian hospital. So you can see that the, uh, the age was in mean uh, around uh, 60, uh, mostly male, uh, where the weight uh, for patient, we were admit to the ICU of uh, 88. And uh, the comorbidity, it's uh, uh, very, uh, the same that uh, what was described. Uh, we have twenty uh, percent of uh, respiratory comorbidity and uh, 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 fifty-eight of cardiovascular comorbidity and a high uh, number of uh, diabetes patients. And uh, about the recitation management. Uh, most uh, of the patients were uh, uh, invasively uh, ventilated. Uh, we had uh, 15 uh, ECMO and uh, prone position in 64% uh, of the patients. Uh, vasoactive agents were used in 55% uh, of the patients. A high level of dialysis, uh, 21% and uh, uh, mortality in the ICU, high mortality, around 40% uh, uh, of the mortality. Uh, the lockdown was uh, decided on uh, the 17th of March, and uh, it's uh, plan to stop the lockdown the uh, 11th of May. Uh, so uh, it was... Uh, very impressive how uh, people were involved uh, to uh, manage this and uh, to uh, uh, every day find a new organization, every day open new beds. And uh, it was very uh, impressive. And uh, we try to do our best to give uh, all the treatment that this patient uh, needed. Thank you very much indeed. So, I said we'll take questions later on. So now an update from the United Kingdom. So you, you can see on the slide here that we've had over 130,000 cases tested positive for COVID in the United Kingdom so far. And our current figures, which are can only be regarded as an estimate at the moment because of some of the reporting challenges with regards to community deaths is over 18,000, very sadly. Um, the hotspots, uh, looking at the map on the right hand side, um, London, for example, being our largest metropolitan area, is in the southeast of the country, which is uh, where I work. And we seem to see one of the biggest early surges, but then some of the other hotspots around the country are, as you might expect, the more heavily populated areas. Our ICU bed capacity in the UK is one of the lowest in Europe having around 6.5 to 7 beds per 100,000. So like many places, one of the initial challenges we had was a rapid increase in capacity, which within our National Health Service represented a massive team effort, both re with regards to um, the reallocation of resources and the training up of other staff. You may also have heard that to give us surge capacity, 
the so-called Nightingale hospitals were built in convention centres sequentially across the country starting in London. I think we could say the good news so far is we've, have, we've had to use relatively little of that capacity by working together as a community in London, for example, regular daily communication from our critical care leaders to ensure the fact that we maximise the use of the close to existing ICU bed stock before having to go to these out of hospital resources. Let's hope it stays that way. Uh, patient zero, we think was on the 31st of January. Our lockdown, very similar to those we've heard from our colleagues to the east of us in Europe, was on the 23rd of March, so a little bit later. It also seems as though our surge was coming a little bit later than our colleagues we've just heard from, so we could do a lot of preparation, relatively speaking, based on learning that we'd had from China and then Italy and so on for Europe. Political actions that we're taking sounds very similar to colleagues we've just heard from. We've gone for this so-called lockdown, including the schools and then the restaurants, bars, etc. We've actually had relatively limited testings. There's quite a lot of ongoing controversy in the UK as to whether this was a deliberate policy or not. It's been very much concentrated in hospital and close to the bedside. It's uh, still a debate about the use of masks outside of a hospital or even inside a hospital environment away from direct patient contact. And that may change in the next week or so. We've just been told that our lockdown period is probably going to extend for a considerable further period of time. Uh, treatment pathways and best practice sharing, they've been led by our national societies and so-called Royal, Royal Colleges, but very much informed by the European and global community. Uh, with regards to uh, nas national efforts and what are thought to be the most valuable actions, it seems as though we already had a so-called flattening of the curve, it's called different things in different countries, prior to the lockdown as a result of a public health campaign that very much focused on hand washing in the first instance. That then followed by the so-called lockdown and social distancing. It does seem as though that has resulted in our new ICU capacity just about being able to cope, but it's uncertain if we'd be able to cope with a second surge. So let's hope it stays that way at the moment. So that's it from the UK update. We're now going to head straight into some so-called case presentations and towards the back end we'll do some Q&A. So we're now going to hear about hemodynamic management for COVID-19 patients guidelines and recommendations from uh, Antonio Messina. Uh, leading this particular section. Antonio, over to you, thank you. Yes, thank you. So, uh, well, uh, speaking about the hemodynamic management, my presentation uh, will be based on the, um, first of all, on the uh, assessment of the guideline-based management. Then we will try to focus on uh, the right ventricle function and, and monitoring the right ventricle function at the bedside, and then trying to trust our guideline suggestion uh, to the bedside of, uh, of our patient. So basically, if we assess, if you look at the suggestions, uh, these are the guidelines of the European Society recently um, managed, uh, we can see that uh, the suggestions are related to the uh, type of fluids to be used, uh, which are, we should be crystalloids over colloids and preferably uh, buffer and balance and crystalloids. Uh, but also, uh, they, of course, uh, the, the suggesting the, a conservative over liberal free st strategy. Uh, this is related to the known evidence uh, regarding the RDS patient, non COVID uh, RDS patients. And also, uh, they suggest to use dynamic parameters and uh, clinical um, uh, skills such as uh, skin temperature, capillary field time, or cellulactate uh, to over the static parameters in order to assess the fluid responsiveness. So the problem is how to assess uh, volume status at the bedside. Uh, 
uh, how, w w w to assess how the policy regarding fluid uh, um, uh, fluid administration, which should be conservative, and then the use of norepinephrine as the first line vasoactive agent. If we move uh, the other side uh, of the ocean, uh, these are the JAMA uh, guidelines published recently in the last uh, uh, week of March, we can see that uh, probably the suggestions are um, roughly the same. And uh, um, so, again, conservative uh, strategy, crystalloids over colloids and norepinephrine. However, uh, just to consider the balance uh, in the hemodynamic man monitoring uh, and assessment of these patients, on the one hand, uh, we should think about uh, fluid balance uh, at the bedside, the right ventricle function, and the venous return. And just consider that most of these patients uh, do not show signs of shock at the very beginning of the presentation of the disease, but are still hypovolemic uh, when they are, the, they are admitted in the emergency department. Uh, just because of prolonged febrile period at home, uh, roughly patients are admitted, uh, I mean, in, in my hospital after five to seven days at home, tachypnea and diarrhea. So most of these patients are actually hypovolemic. On the other side, uh, considering the overall afterload of the right ventricle, uh, we should consider the respiratory compliance of the system and how we try to ventilate the patients, meaning the PEEP and the driving pressure applied, and also the oxygenation. Why? Because we know that the, phys the physiology of the right ventricle is, uh, is quite complex, uh, not still well understood, but basically is related uh, to the fact that uh, the, uh, the, the right ventricle is not able uh, to increase rock volume uh, uh, after a sudden increase uh, in uh, its afterload. So basically, every time we increase the afterload in the right, uh, uh, to, for the right ventricle, then the right ventricle responds uh, uh, limiting the stroke volume and increasing uh, the pressure inside. This is particularly true if we consider the U-shaped curves of the pulmonary vascular resistances. Basically, uh, there is a, an important way uh, uh, of uh, reducing uh, the shunt within the lung, which is the um, uh, hypostemic vasoconstriction. So on the other hand, on the one hand, the, this is a, a balancing system, and the other hand, if we uh, apply PEEP or just increase the volume uh, into the lungs, uh, we are going to increase also the afterload of the right ventricle. So basically, the, uh, we need to find out which is the best way to balance these two forces um, for the right ventricle. Moreover, the effect of mechanical ventilation is uh, much higher in those patients which are hypovolemic, as shown in this paper, uh, the group of Michard, in, uh, 15 years ago. The more the patient is hypovolemic, and the higher is the effect of mechanical ventilation. So before applying high level of PEEP, or uh, before applying uh, um, mechanical ventilation, uh, we should try to fix uh, the balance uh, uh, between preload and afterload, and try to fix uh, uh, hypovolemia. At the bedside, uh, we suggest to use uh, very simple markers of tissue dysoxia, just because uh, uh, these numbers should be very simple to achieve, very reproducible, and very, uh, quite reliable. So, for example, the capillary field time, the lactate level, the gap of CO2, meaning the difference between uh, arterial and venous CO2 skin modeling and uh, uh, the, uh, oxygen saturation, venous oxygen saturation. Why? Because uh, if I think that the manipulation of cardiac output could be able to improve my tissue perfusion, then I will consider the hemodynamic monitoring as an a, um, a instrument to allow me to assess which is the best cardiac output to my patient. So uh, this implies that the, cardiac, the dynamic monitoring should be considered as the second step after a very uh, careful uh, assessment of tissue dysoxia by means of clinical patterns. And how to perform fluid administration? These are uh, still unpublished data and they are retrieved for uh, or our patients or a surgical patient. But just to say that um, it, it's better to use a small amount of fluids, administering a very few minutes uh, 
Uh, we, um, for example, the Minifi challenge, uh, 100 minutes uh, over one minute, is able also to affect and to change this historic arterial pressure, which would be also measured non I'm not, I'm not going to say that the historic arterial pressure and stroke volume are very closely linked together. For sure, the relationship is not linear. Uh, but when the increase in systolic pressure is quite high, higher than 10%, then the possibility that the patient is actually responding also to fluids is particularly high. Moreover, the rate of administration is important because uh, the lower is the rate of administration and the lower is the response in terms also of pressure variables, meaning that implying that if we use a, a faster rate of infusion, then we can try to use also a non-invasive parameter to assess the response to fluid administration. This is an expert opinion panel published in 2016, and basically the, the authors consider mandatory the use of PPV, the pulse pressure variation, and the echo, to, uh, uh, as a hemodynamic monitoring or red ventricle function in our, radiation, in our patients. And moreover, they had very few uh, specific numbers, uh, which are mostly related to uh, the assessment of fluid balance uh, in, in our patient. But they also suggest that conservative strategy, again, is beneficial for red ventricle support, but just after resolution of the shock phase. So, uh, um, the, the, the resolution of shock phase is mandatory and should be performed before uh, using right ventricle uh, support. Why the PPV? So uh, basically the pulse pressure variation is uh, created by the uh, use of fixed uh, mechanical breath uh, to the, in, into the, the patient. So uh, the repetitive changes uh, during mechanical ventilation. And actually, uh, there are at least uh, three reasons to do not use PPV in RDS patient to assess fluid responsiveness, which are the low tidal volume, the low system compliance, um, and also the fact that right ventricle could be uh, partially affected by the ventilation. But if we consider when the PPV is high and we have no signs of relative or absolute hypovolemia, then high PPV could be related to uh, the distension of right ventricle, meaning that uh, the, the PPV could be used as a wording uh, to assess a quick change in right ventricle function due to the changes in the afterload, implying that the, if the PPV rises up uh, uh, from 10 to 15 and we just change something in the ventilator, probably we're going to affect the right ventricle function. And this could be very useful at the bedside. These are two area patients from uh, our population. And as you can see, the, the impairment of, of the uh, parenchymal uh, of the lung is not uh, necessarily related to the compliance uh, of the system. So uh, maybe we can have a low compliance and higher uh, PO2-FO2 ratio and or a higher compliance and lower PO2-FO2 ratio implying that setting PIP in this patient could be very challenging, especially, especially uh, at the beginning of the disease. And we need to be very careful in applying PIP uh, without monitoring right ventricle, uh, right ventricle function. Uh, looking at the data for at the admission of uh, this subgroup of patients, the first 40 patients admitted uh, to our ICU, as you can see, the total compliance is roughly 40, uh, which is uh, quite in between between the H and L uh, phenotypes described recently by the group of uh, uh, Professor Gattinoni. Uh, and the pure 2 fio 2 ratio uh, was about 140, meaning uh, uh, moderate areas, but the applied PIP was uh, uh, quite high, uh, 13, uh, implying that uh, some patients uh, had uh, 16 or 15 of PIP and some other 8 to 10. Uh, this uh, uh, was also uh, related to a normal mean arterial pressure and a normal lactate level. So, as I said before, most of these patients uh, actually are not in shock once admitted in the ICU. So, uh, basically, trying to transfer guidelines into clinical patterns, uh, uh, I'd say that uh, Hemodynamic monitoring uh, should be useful uh, using dynamic indexes, for example, as PPV, but also uh, to use uh, some other tests, uh, like functional hemodynamic tests, 
uh, I'm going to explain how and why. And the uh, echocardiography for monitoring right ventricle function. Just think about that the risk of pulmonary embolism in this patient could be quite high, as I recently described uh, uh, in other papers. And uh, we can also assess uh, the inferior vena cava collapsibility, uh, which again uh, uh, is uh, limited as a um, monitoring of fluid responsiveness, but could be useful uh, to assess quickly the possible for patient to be respond uh, to fluid administration. Um, what is a, a functional hemodynamic test? So basically, a functional hemodynamic test is a challenge uh, to the system, to the cardiovascular system, uh, which is able to affect, to change the response in responders and no responders in a different uh, way, to a different extent. There are at least uh, three functional hemodynamic tests which has been uh, already validated in early patients and uh, in patients with the low pulmonary compliance, uh, which are the passive grazing, uh, which is, which all know is a is a postural change, uh, is a postural change and uh, an auto flu challenge, uh, the end spiritual occlusion test and the mini flu challenge. The end spiritual occlusion test is a test which is performed by uh, hold the expiration for a while, 15 to 30 seconds, and see what happens uh, at, uh, at the stroke volume. And the mini fluid challenge is a quick infusion of a small amount of fluid, um, usually 100 ml of fluids uh, over one minute. Uh, to consider how uh, the patient uh, is going to respond to this test, uh, just think about that the, the cutoff used to assess flu responsiveness after these tests are uh, uh, quite small, uh, meaning 5% of change in stroke volume. That's the reason why, uh, as, as first, we need a continuous hemodynamic monitoring to assess the changes uh, in stroke volume after these tests. Uh, we can also use uh, the uh, echocardiography, but it is uh, much more complicated. Uh, so, but also we require a precise, uh, precise uh, technique uh, of measurement of stroke volume because uh, of these small changes in the stroke volume. Moreover, some of these tests uh, has uh, intrinsic limitation, uh, for example, the partial organase in trauma patients, uh, but uh, or patients with uh, uh, abdominal uh, hypertension. Uh, and the end test uh, is, uh, is less useful in patients retaining to some extent uh, spontaneous breathing activity or not in, non intubated patients. Again, these are data from our patient during the first week. And as you can see, uh, one third of, of our patients received no epinephrine, but the rate of infusion the, uh, it was uh, quite uh, small, uh, 0 0.15, uh, probably much more related to the sedation needed to keep this patient uh, um, uh, mechanical, mechanically ventilated. And the linear tear pressure and the arterate rate, again, quite normal and lactate as well, with a low rate of uh, renal replacement therapy, but during the first week, then the, the, the rate after the first wind watch uh, was uh, uh, higher. Uh, and we also, uh, also with the help of our cardiologists uh, uh, in our hospital, uh, we try to assess uh, uh, the echocardiography at the bedside because most of our patients had uh, um, some kind of increase in troponin level. Uh, this, this change in troponin, uh, even if quite small, uh, were attributed to COVID infection. So this patient had uh, a myocardial, probably a myocardial um, impairment due to COVID infection. But again, uh, the echocardiography show, uh, shows uh, uh, normal EF in the ejection fraction in most of our patients and a normal function in terms of TAPS. Uh, however, some of these patients uh, showed uh, um, uh, some kind of dilation or right ventricle function, even if the TAPS uh, was uh, quite, uh, uh, quite normal. So, uh, considering uh, an overview of hemodynamic monitoring, just uh, uh, start with uh, a clinical examination. Why? Because, uh, for example, we had to increase uh, of fivefold uh, the number of level two and level three beds in our ICU and in our wards, implying that the mean expertise of uh, nurses and physicians at the bedside uh, 
uh, was different. So we need to give uh, them uh, very precise, very reliable, very simple information at the bedside uh, because, for example, we uh, during the day we had, uh, we have still had four shifts uh, or of uh, six hours uh, implying four changes of uh, uh, physician and nurses uh, um, every day. So the clinical semination using the capillary field time, lactates uh, and uh, uh, skin moting and uh, saturation is uh, venous saturation is uh, is very important and must be uh, done every uh, every time every time is possible. Then peep optimization uh, 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 optimization of volumia should be considered as part of the same problem. So um, when we try to assess uh, and to use uh, the best PEEP, uh, then consider the volume of the patient. So do not try to use high level of PEEP in patients which are actually hypovolemic, even if they are not in shock. And echo hemodynamic monitoring to have a quick look at uh, the right ventricle function, consider the dilation of the right ventricle function and the TAPS uh, as uh, uh, quick markers of assessment of uh, um, right ventricle function. And then uh, uh, numbers such as PPV or the extravascular lung water index uh, which could be quite useful uh, to track the changes uh, in our free balance uh, if we would like to be conservative, as suggested. But if you have a new onset of hypotension, just because these patients are quite stable in terms of hemodynamics, a new onset of hypotension should be quite quickly addressed um, because even uh, using the same, the echo the hemodynamic monitoring. If we found a new onset of hypotension and the right ventricle dilated, then we should exclude the presence of pulmonary embolism uh, in, in our patient. But just think about also the possibility of the development of a septic shock due to uh, hospital acquired new infection not related to COVID infection. And for example, our, the, median, um, the median rate of ICU stay uh, of our patient is about uh, 10, uh, 11, 12 days. So it's quite possible that the patient uh, uh, developed a different kind of infection after the COVID. And these are my take home messages. So, COVID uh, management is based on the same principle we used for non COVID health patients. The hemodynamic management should start after the clinical examination. And patiently are frequently hypovolemic at admission. So please consider the possibility of uh, um, of manager uh, of manager uh, hypovolemia before applying uh, PEEP. Tolerate zero of fluid balance until the management of PEEP or ventricular function is not fine, and then target negative fluid balance uh, implying fluid restriction over days. Had bedside echocardiography uh, to use it, uh, uh, also basic hemodynamic monitoring using the PPV uh, to assess our ventricle function over days. Uh, more complex hemodynamic monitoring uh, uh, could be used, but just for selected patients. Um, and pay attention to other hospital acquired infection and uh, pulmonary embolism as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Antonio. The next section we're going to be switching to two case presentations. The first one is going to come from um, Jacques, Jacques Duranteau, and these are going to be case reports using advanced hemodynamic monitoring uh, to aid in the resuscitation of the patients. Jacques. Thank you, Monty. So uh, just to share with you this uh, clinical case that uh, we had, and it was uh, when uh, we had a very high flow of patients in the ICU. So it's a uh, 62 years old man uh, with a uh, BMI of uh, 32, hypertension and uh, diabetes. And uh, so uh, it's uh, at this time we were at day five of the ICU admission and uh, the patient was ventilated uh, with volume assist control ventilation at uh, 6 ml per kilogram with a PEP of 10 and uh, uh, FiO2 of 100 uh, percent with a low respiratory compliance it was 30 and uh, the patient was sedated with uh, midazolam 
and uh, with uh, Deep Rivon, and uh, with uh, uh, the, this patient had a neuromuscular blocking agent. Uh, and you can see that uh, uh, the percentage of uh, lesion uh, was more than uh, 50%. So uh, to uh, monitor this uh, patient, uh, we uh, use uh, a monitor uh, considering uh, area under the curve to uh, give uh, an evaluation of uh, cardiac index. So, uh, and uh, we use uh, the arterial catheter because it was uh, quick and easy. Uh, and uh, we uh, observe a mid arterial pressure of uh, 71. This was uh, without uh, any uh, vasopressive drugs uh, with an heart rate of uh, 99. The cardiac index was equal to 3.2, with a stroke volume index of uh, 32. The PPV was equal to 5%, with the stroke uh, uh, variation uh, was equal to 4. With this monitor, uh, we have an index of, uh, of prediction of uh, hypotension, and uh, it's uh, uh, when we have more than uh, uh, 80% yet that we will have to face to an hypotension uh, in uh, the uh, future uh, 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 15 minutes. So it was uh, at this time 41%. The CVP was equal to 9. Uh, the PO2 uh, was 66, so a very low uh, PO2 and PO2 ratio with uh, a central saturation of uh, 79% and a PVO2 of uh, uh, 51 millimeters of mercury. The lactate uh, was increasing 2.9. And at this time, uh, the uh, patient was in a supine position. So we perform an echography, but the window was not very good, but uh, uh, we exclude any right ventricular failure. So, uh, and uh, we observe a decrease in mean arterial pressure. Uh, we have a slight decrease in cardiac index, a slight increase in PPV and in SVVV and uh, with an increase in uh, HPI. The CVP was quite similar and uh, no uh, improvement uh, of the PO2 uh, and the lactate was uh, increasing. So uh, at this time, uh, in, uh, as the lactate uh, was increasing, we think of uh, performing a fluid challenge but uh, as it was previously mentioned, we are always afraid to give free to this patient. And uh, we really uh, want to be in a conservative strategy concerning fluid. So uh, to, uh, we perform a tidal volume challenge and uh, we increase uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the uh, tidal volume. Uh, uh, going uh, uh, from six uh, uh, to eight and uh, challenging uh, the cardiovascular system to see if we uh, observe an increase in PPV or an increase in SVV, uh, uh, which uh, indicates that the patient uh, was uh, fluid uh, dependent and uh, we observe no change. So uh, we uh, uh, stopped the idea to give uh, fluid and uh, we consider uh, the fact that uh, to treat uh, the decrease in mean arterial pressure and try to improve, uh, to decrease also the lactate, uh, we uh, start norepinephrine and we stop deprimant. 
So uh, in the mean arterial pressure, we observe an increase in mean arterial pressure, and uh, we have an increase in cardiac index. Cardiac index was uh, uh, after uh, starting norepinephrine equal to 3.3. Uh, a decrease in PPV and a decrease in SVV, uh, whereas uh, a CVP uh, uh, was slightly increased, was 10. Uh, and uh, uh, we observe uh, an increase of the, P, uh, uh, the uh, PRO2 uh, it, because it increases to 95 millimeters of mercury. So, uh, nice increase in uh, PaO2 and uh, the PVO2 uh, increase also, but a slight increase, five millimeters of mercury, and the lactate was uh, the same. Uh, so, um, after uh, we, uh, uh, we uh, perform uh, prone position, and uh, uh, we observe uh, an improvement in the lactate, an improvement of the PaO2, uh, because uh, we obtain 129 millimeters of mercury. But what was, uh, in my point of view, impressive is uh, when we start norepinephrine and when we stop deprivant, uh, we observe this uh, uh, increase in PaO2 in this very, very severe patient. And uh, so, uh, and uh, just to share and to discuss with you, uh, because it could be uh, related in my point of view, but maybe you will have other idea that first uh, by starting norepinephrine, we improve the venous return, and uh, by improving the venous return, uh, we uh, uh, induce uh, uh, a redistribution of the perfusion. And uh, maybe uh, if we consider the effect on the PO2, uh, we uh, add a decrease in the shent. And uh, so I think it's my point of view uh, the first hypothesis. A second one could be uh, an effect of low PVO2, but uh, if I consider that we observe only an increase of five millimeters of mercury, I think that this hypothesis uh, was uh, in the second line. And uh, so it's uh, maybe in the discussion, you will have uh, other hypotheses and uh, but it's uh, to share uh, this clinical case with you and uh, to discuss around this. So uh, to uh, leave place to the discussion, my key message was first that uh, it's the usefulness of hemodynamic monitoring in this patient, the limit of uh, dynamic parameters, and the fact it's always very difficult to interpret uh, with, uh, when we ventilate this patient with a low vol uh, tidal volume, the usefulness of a tidal volume challenge to prevent uh, any uh, excessive uh, fluid. Uh, and uh, so the fact that uh, uh, it's very important to stay in a conservative uh, strategy uh, and also the role of hypoxic vasoconstriction we know that in this patient, maybe we have a loss of uh, epoxic vasoconstriction, but I think that uh, we have to be careful when we use a uh, vasodilation agent as deprivant because we can uh, affect this uh, epoxic vasoconstriction. And uh, uh, maybe uh, the norepinephrine was capable uh, to increase the epoxic vasoconstriction in this clinical case. This uh, effect of norepinephrine has uh, uh, only been described in uh, uh, a very uh, uh, low number of publications, uh, but uh, it's uh, possible that norepinephrine 
is able uh, to uh, uh, improve hypoxic vasoconstriction and uh, to redistribute uh, the perfusion and decrease the shunt. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much indeed. So we have one more case presentation to go before we get into the Q&A and on the chat where questions are coming in we have a long list to go through so that's very encouraging high level of engagement so for our last presentation i'm going to hand back our case presentation to, to uh, ignacio thank you Monty. let me share my screen with all of you okay well i uh, i would like to show how the hemodynamic profile in the COVID-19 patient could be uh, managed according to a physiological approach based on respiratory mechanics. Let's just start with this first case. This is a 65 years old male with a clinical history of arterial hypertension, chronic pulmonary and renal disease, and the patient was COVID-19 positive, obviously. This is the pre-admission to ICU chest X-ray. And this was the chest X-ray after intubation and connection to mechanical ventilation. You can see the respiratory mechanics with a respiratory compliance of 55. And the patient was ventilated in volume control with a six millimeter per kilogram and a PIP level of 10. Well, if we remember that uh, phenotypes proposed by Luciano Gattinoni, uh, those patients with a nearly normal respiratory compliance could be determined, could be defined as a low pulmonary elastin patients or phenotype. This patient usually show a minimum infiltrates in chest X-ray. They have a loss of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, and they should manage with a load with a tidal volume of seven to eight millimeters per kilogram. Uh, PIP level slightly lower than the you, that we used for the ARDS patient, and prone position should be used only as a rescue maneuver. Well, what will be the hemodynamic profile according to these respiratory mechanics? Well, when we have a normal respiratory or nearly normal respiratory compliance, we can we can find an increased transmission of the airway pressure to parallel pressure that will affect mainly to the right ventricular pillow. The higher impact will be on the right ventricular pillow. Uh, due to the loss of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, we can find normal pulmonary arterial pressure. And the uh, effects of PEEP, pump position, and line recruitment maneuvers will mainly affect the right ventricular pillow due to this high or enhanced transmission of the airway pressure to the pleural pressure. Moreover, the prone position may decrease cardiac output because of an increase in abdominal pressure and the collapse of the inferior vena cava. Therefore, the oxygenation that we can find with the prone position could be due to a better redistribution of the flow. And what could be the hemodynamic strategy in these patients with a nearly normal respiratory compliance or as the Luciano Gattinoni defined as a pul low pulmonary elastance? The first thing we should remember that we should ensure an adequate red ventricular payload. And our fluid strategy should be focused to avoid the development of lung edema. But we should be very careful about the use of a very restrictive fluid strategy because those patients are very sensitive to, heart, to, to changes in right ventricular payload. Due to the normal respiratory compliance, and because we are using tidal volumes between seven and 80 millimeters of mercury, the use of, of pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation could be helpful to guide the fluid therapy. Now, let's consider the second case. This is a 52 years old male with a clinical history of arterial hypertension and diabetes. It was also positive to COVID-19 infection. This is the uh, chest X-ray before ICU admission. It was after ICU admission, and this is the chest X-ray after intubation and uh, connection to mechanical ventilation with a volume control mode, six millimeter per kilogram and PIP level of 12 centimeters of water. 
the respiratory mechanics for this patient was a respiratory compliance lower than the uh, uh, previous case with a 30 centimeters of water. And if we remember the definition of the other phenotype, according to the respiratory mechanic, this patient could be, the, could be defined as a high pulmonary elastins phenotype. Those patients have a low respiratory compliance. They have a white X-ray because the, the lungs are wet and they are our usual ARDS patients and they should be managed with a low tidal volume, higher PIP levels and the use of pro position. What will be the hemodynamic profile according to these respiratory mechanics? Well, in this case, because we have a very low respiratory compliance with the, the airway pressure, we increase the transpulmonary pressure and that will affect mainly to the right ventricular afterload. Then it is common to see high pulmonary arteries and the impact of PEEP proposition and large recruitment maneuvers will depend on the pulmonary recruitability. Moreover, prone position may increase cardiac output if we are able to decrease the pulmonary vascular resistance with the prone position. And the oxygenation will improve because of a pulmonary recruitment, not to our, it's also a, to a redistribution, but we will see also a pulmonary recruitment. The hemodynamic strategy in this case Will be different. We should minimize the impact of right ventricular function, decreasing right ventricular afterload. Our fluid strategy should be focused to reduce lung edema. And the help of the pulmonary vasodilators could be useful in this case to reduce the uh, high right ventricular afterload, high pulmonary artery pressures. And we should be aware of the false negative with the pulse pressure variation and the stroke volume variation, as our previous speakers said, because of the low tidal volume, low respiratory compliance, <clears throat> but also the false positive case due to the right ventricular dysfunction. Thank you. Thank you very much for all the excellent presentations. We're going to get into some question and answer now if i remember to turn my camera back on <laughs> terrible sharing by the way <coughs> there we go um if i may ignacio ask you one question and then i'll bring it to the others before we get into the selection of questions that will come back in you described the two phenotypes which we've heard a lot uh, spoken about have you seen both of those phenotypes at presentation or do you see patients transitioning from one to the other and at presentation, do you think, have you seen that one is more common than the other? Well, I can give you a definitive answer to that, but I'm pretty sure that this is not a self excluding phenotypes. They could be present at, this, at the same patient on different times evolution. I mean, we can start with the uh, low respiratory elastins phenotype, and we can end with a high respiratory elastins phenotype so I think it's important to remember that this is this uh, physiological approach is not associated to these uh, phenotypes. Indeed, it's it's a physiological rationale of what will be the hemodynamic profiles according to respiratory mechanics, but not only for this COVID-19 patient, but also for all patients indeed. So I think it's important to, to remember that these phenotypes or this respiratory mechanics profile could be present at the same patient with different time evolution. We have a, we have a, a not a large experience as, as our Italian colleagues, but we found the, both types of patients at the beginning, but they usually develop the high last and pulmonary phenotype at the end. Could I ask the other two presenters to both comment on that as well, on the, 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 the phenotype from their uh, uh, position? Jack, would you like to go first? Yes. Uh, I think uh, that uh, really it's, uh, it's possible to have transition between one phenotype to the other, and it could be very dependent uh, uh, from one day to another day. So uh, really, for me, it's a dynamic process and uh, depending on uh, if the patient uh, get more severe or not and depending on the compliance 
So really, uh, we have uh, for me, it's uh, we have always to test uh, the, for example, uh, the uh, response, the hemodynamic response, and uh, we have to do this uh, day by day. Antonio, on the phenotypes. Yeah. Yeah, um, I agree. I mean, uh, as shown, uh, we have seen patients with uh, um, medium compliance, which was uh, actually in between. Uh, my suggestion is uh, to not to do not apply necessary high level of PEEP uh, if the CT scan is very bad. I mean, not just trying to uh, use high level of PEEP because the impairment of the lung is very high, because we have seen different uh, responses in terms of, of oxygenation and hemodynamics. Uh, with similar patterns of CT scan. So also the uh, response to the prone position uh, is quite unusual sometimes. Uh, so um, just be careful and just apply a step-by-step -step approach, both for aerodynamics and for ventilation. So, so before I go to the questions, Antonio, and I'll just ask you this in the interest of time. Uh, if, if you didn't know it was COVID-19 and it was just business as usual, do you actually do anything different to a normal day on the intensive care unit from the point of view well, of the hemodynamic resuscitation? Well, um, I think that uh, these kinds of patients are very, very challenging in terms of hemodynamic assessment. I would suggest to use uh, more uh, small and repetitive and fast fluid boluses instead of uh, continuous infusion. I mean, we need to assess the hemodynamics much more frequently as compared to other, other patients. And so probably the free challenge is the key uh, to do not uh, to avoid uh, overload and to avoid the risk of overload day by day. So avoid the continuous infusion and just use very quick amount of fluids administered day by day. So I'll take the questions sequentially now through our contributors, but if anyone feels that they'd like to dive in with a question if you just show me your hand so I can divert to you. So the first question is about the possible choice between vasopressin as a first line vasopressor compared to norepinephrine, particularly with emphasis with regards to its effect on pulmonary vasoconstriction. Jacques, would you like to have that one first? Yes, Any views because, on vasopressin? I, yes because uh, I think that uh, and it's why it's very important uh, to monitor uh, our patient, because I think that uh, by using uh, vasopressor, uh, we uh, are able uh, to decrease the quantity of liquid that uh, we have to give to this patient. Uh, but also, it's uh, we have to be very cautious by because at what point uh, we can have uh, hypovolemia and we can miss hypovolemia by a conservative strategy, uh, by given vasopressor, and after uh, one, two days, uh, we uh, can uh, go too far, and uh, it's important uh, to uh, test uh, if the patient, for example, is preload dependent, and I'm completely agree that by performing a small free challenge, it's a good way uh, to be sure that uh, we don't miss uh, hypovolemia. And sometimes it's very difficult because uh, acute kidney injury is uh, very frequent in this patient. And uh, we have uh, uh, many patients with oliguria. And, and with regards to the choice of vasopressor, do, do you or do any of the uh, other two speakers, would they choose vasopressin? as an alternative to norepinephrine. Does anyone have any strong feelings about that? Uh, I don't have any experience with the vasopressin. No, yes. it's, the, it's the same for me. I mean, we, have, we use a very uh, quite low level of norepinephrine and we didn't use vasopressin with patients. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, we have not uh, enough experience about vasopressin, uh, but uh, for me it's the same. Uh, with vasopressin, you can think that uh, you can uh, have uh, a better uh, improvement concerning kidney, uh, but right now uh, there is no obvious uh, proof of this in the literature. 
so at the end, I think when we only consider the vasoactive effect, for me, it's a good alternative to norepinephrine. But we use first norepinephrine. So Ignatio, if you could take these next two together, how are you measuring volume responsiveness in patients with PEEP equal or greater than 15 centimeters of water? And the second one is, is it possible to use PPV with a low tidal volume of six mils per kilo? I think this was touched on in some of the presentations. So PEEP greater than 15 and, and tidal volume less than six or six or less. Well, that's a good question because it's not the actual, the, the PIB level which uh, impact on the performance of the PPV, but the tidal volume. So if, we, I'm go if I'm using a PIB level of 15 centimeters of water, uh, I should consider about the tidal volume. If the tidal volume is low, it's low, lower than 80 millimeters of kilogram. We should be careful about the use of uh, the stroke volume variation or pulse pressure variation because of the false negative cases because of this uh, as Antonio explained in, in his presentation, that there could be a false uh, negative. Regarding in patients with a low tidal volume, uh, we have a lot of other uh, parameters. For example, a tidal volume challenge, we can use the passively racing. Even in patients in prone position, we can change the position of the patient with the head down, and we can check the change in the cardiac index in patients in prone position but there are a lot of other maneuvers that we can use when all these other parameters, the stroke volume variation and pulse pressure variation have the limitations. So there is not only pulse pressure variation and stroke volume variation. We can test, we can challenge the cardiovascular system in many other ways to check if the patient is preload responder. My preferred one is the passively racing when it's possible to do that but we should be uh, careful about that we, we, because we cannot go inside to the patient's room every time we need to check the uh, uh, free responsiveness state. So we cannot perform passively racing every time we want. But as Antonio said before, if we have a very high uh, pulse pressure variation, the stroke volume variation in a patient with a low tidal volume, we should check first if, it's not, if this is not due to a right ventricular dysfunction, but if we are sure about that, we should consider that this stroke volume variation or high pulse pressure variation is related to an actual preload responsiveness condition. Uh, uh, Antonio, we have two questions here about um, therapies that may not be commonly used. One relates to the use of cytokine filters, uh, and the other one relates to the, the possible use of hyperbaric oxygen. Now, we wouldn't have the ability to give hyperbaric oxygen in our center. I have worked in centers where we could do that and we would not consider it for these patients. But Antonio, did you hear in Italy any of those two therapies being tried? Uh, I have no experience with the second one. I mean, uh, uh, I, I don't know any, anyone else uh, trying to use that in Italy, to be honest. Uh, regarding no. the first one, uh, again, uh, it's nothing useful to try different kind of therapies in these patients. Uh, uh, also in terms of uh, new drugs or, or different kind of, uh, or things. I guess that uh, the patient should be very quick, very selected, I mean, in terms of uh, possibility of responding to these uh, kind of therapies. So we don't have enough uh, evidence regarding that in so far, but anyway, uh, this should be considered for selected kind of patients. Jack, any uh, experience with the, the filters for um, cytokines? Uh, not enough, uh, but uh, I think uh, it's a good hypothesis or it's a, an interesting one because uh, this patient had obviously a, a pro-inflammatory uh, profile initially. So uh, it could be interesting to try to decrease uh, the uh, cytokine, for example, uh, with this kind of uh, device. Uh, and uh, but uh, uh, this it's a good uh, maybe a good uh, strategy, uh, but uh, it will be interesting to have uh, a proof of this. Uh, and about uh, the hypobaric uh, uh, oxygenation, uh, I have no idea about this. There is some hypothesis of the fact that. Uh, 
COVID uh, could affect the uh, affinity uh, of uh, 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 oxygen for hemoglobin. Uh, but uh, I just uh, read uh, a paper on this and I have no experience of this therapy. Ignacio, anything to add on those two points? No experience with both uh, therapies. Sorry, Monty. So, uh, Antonio, if I can get back to you about an echo question then in the first instance, they're asking about the uh, using IVC collapsibility index as a, a, a way of guiding volume management in these patients? Well, the IVC collapsibility is, um, at the very beginning was used just to assess uh, the central venous pressure. I mean, it was a surrogate to see central venous pressure. Then uh, um, we have added some other possibilities regarding the uh, fluid optimization using this number uh, to assess fluid responsiveness. Uh, anyway, um, there is a, unfortunately, um, a very big study published recently, uh, a French study published in the Blue Journal showing that uh, overall the reliability of this index is rather low. Uh, I think this could be useful when the numbers are very high or very low. So, I mean, in the gray zone of these uh, numbers, uh, such as the PPD and the SED as well. Um, but it is a, it's a good is a good way to assess both the right ventricle function and full responsiveness. So basically, when a physician look at the um, inferior vena cava, it also looks at, at, uh, at the right ventricle function. So probably the best way to do is to combine these two informations together. Thank you. Jacques, the uh, challenging issue with regards to um, pr possible thromboembolisms and the use of full anticoagulation in these patients. Now, the question really relates here that if you had no evidence, objective evidence of thrombosis peripherally and you had no confirmatory evidence of pulmonary embolism, but you did have evidence of right ventricular dysfunction combined with a large AA gradient, were you or are you giving full anticoagulation to those patients? Yes, uh, because uh, uh, in this patient, we have uh, so many uh, thromboembolic events that uh, right now uh, we uh, it is uh, recommended to give uh, full uh, epirinotherapy uh, in this uh, patient. Uh, so, and even with uh, full epirinotherapy, uh, we had uh, very severe pulmonary embolism. So it's very impressive and. Uh, uh, so uh, I think it, it's a good recommendation to start as quickly as possible uh, a full uh, epirization in this patient. Uh, even without confirmation with a CTPA, you would do it yes. in speculation yes, because exactly. of the clinical study. Exactly. Yes. Ignacio, comments on anticoagulation? Well, no, not exactly, because I... Uh, our experience is that in some patients we found a pulmonary embolism in, in COVID patients, but though this pulmonary embolism is not affected to the main pulmonary arteries, only or to the lower arteries, um, I, I'm not sure if that uh, pulmonary embolism is the main factor that determines the increase in right ventricular pressure. Obviously, it will affect in some manner, but I'm not sure if this uh, will lead to the to the uh, to use a high level of uh, heparin, even if you don't have any clue about the pulmonary embolism with a CT scan. Antonio, anticoagulation? Yeah, uh, I do agree with Ignacio. We don't use routinely uh, fully anticoagulation. I mean, um, high levels of, of heparin. Uh, we just use a higher dose of prophylactic uh, um, heparin in these patients uh, unless uh, we don't have the evidence of uh, clinically and uh, relevant uh, pulmonary embolism. So, so uh, a related issue, in other words, if you have evidence of right ventricular dysfunction and evidence of poor gas exchange, where do you stand on the use of nitric oxide? Take Antonio, if you take that first. Na sorry, I, I, I lost the question. Not, not, Nitric oxide. So a similar clinical scenario, ah. you have evidence of right ventricular dysfunction. Yeah. 
we, we, as we have seeing in many patients you've got a large a, a gradient yeah uh, we have used uh, uh, this therapy in very few selected patients uh, most related to um, confirmed increase in afterload uh, but to be honest we didn't see any significant change in the oxygenation and the right ventricle function so probably uh, probably was too late i mean probably this therapy is not able to change uh, the right ventricle function too much if the damage is already stable. Jack, any comments on nitric oxide and then go straight on if you could about yeah. hemodynamic manage management of patients in the prone position? I'm, co I'm completely agree with uh, Antonio. Uh, we try it, uh, but uh, when we have uh, right uh, ventricular failure, most of the time, it's, uh, it's too late, and uh, the results are very uh, small and disappointed with the second side in this case. And, and hemodynamic management of the patients in the prone position, do, do, do you use the same algorithms, anything different because they're prone? Yes, we use the same, uh, and uh, we uh, try to uh, to be very careful uh, about the position uh, to prevent uh, any uh, compartmental syndrome. Uh, I think it's important to repeat this uh, because it could uh, induce uh, a decrease in venous return and uh, we have to be very cautious about this. I Ignacio, did you see any patients with sudden cardiac collapse? And, and the question here relates to if you did, do you think it might in any way have been related to propofol infusion syndrome? Well, we, we haven't seen any patient with a sudden collapse. Uh, our patient usually develop and slowly stayed with a circulatory failure, first with a respiratory failure, we, but we haven't seen any case with a sudden uh, uh, cardiovascular collapse, at, but in even in those cases, we should start thinking about the pulmonary embolism, for example. I, I think it will be first to the to to define if this patient has a pulmonary embolism or not before thinking about the uh, this, that that syndrome. Ignacio, do you use the tidal volume challenge in your patients? And if if you do, no. do you worry at all about? No. Okay. So, Antonio, no, no, I, I, in I, using I, the title, sorry, go on, Ignacio. Uh, no problem. No, no, to be honest, no. Uh, there is no evidence regarding the use of tidal volume challenge in patients with uh, um, low compliance uh, and FDS. I mean, in terms of physiology, it could be useful, uh, but we don't have still evidence uh, uh, to support the use uh, routinely I mean, in this patient. But anyway, is it? is an option for sure, but we prefer to use a mini fluid challenge or eventually the passive regulation when possible. So, I agree. Uh, and, and, okay, great, thank you. Uh, Antonio, um, if we stay for a second on vasodilators, do, have you tried any alternative vasodilators? Have, have you tried any drugs or alternative ways of of causing vasodilatation. It doesn't seem like a very rational strategy as hypoxic vasoconstriction seems to be one of the challenges. Yeah, uh, in, term, in terms of physiology, it seems reasonable, but to be honest, we did not apply it um, very much. Most of our patients were uh, actually uh, hypertensive patients, so uh, we just managed the hypertension using normal drugs used to uh, apply uh, um, normal management of, of, of this pressure and to be honest nothing related to the function of the um, of the land in terms of uh, change of physiology and um, very low use of, of uh, other agents regarding the vasodilation so we're getting uh, closer to the end of our time in Q&A now I know there's a question oh sorry uh, if you want to come in on that no 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 Yes, may I okay. ask a, a question to... Uh, uh, certainly, certainly. Uh, so when you have to deal with... Have, when you have to deal with an hypertensive uh, uh, patient, uh, do you increase uh, your level of mid-arterial pressure? Or did you uh, uh, observe... Uh, uh, what is your strategy? 
or do you stay at uh, 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 65 millimeters of mercury? Antonio, where do you stand on the map, threshold map? Yeah. I guess it, it could be useful to uh, assess hemodynamic function and pulmonary function at different level of uh, mean arterial pressure, because sometimes a patient needs higher level of pressure to improve oxygenation and to balance the function between right ventricle function and lung system. But anyway, there is not a clear um, cutoff for, 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 to, to be generalized. I mean, it could be set for each single patient every day, probably. And Ignacio, do you have a particular map level when your patients are in established organ failure or, or run with the sort of 65? We, we remain on the 65 millimeters of mercury and we try to uh, optimize that threshold depending on the patient but we usually use that threshold as a, a minimum level of security for keeping the mean arterial pressure over a security uh, pressure for all the patients. So, um, Thank you. Ignacio, I'll stay with you and go around because this is a very common question that's coming in from people. Uh, it's, it sounds as though everyone thinks that you should, after, after a patient has been intubated, for example, you should start by doing classical resuscitation. So you should give enough fluid that you feel confident that you've restored blood volume and flow. After that, is there a particular volume of fluid that you would not be comfortable to go beyond if they're still... Uh, preload responsive because there's this there's this balance between the sort of conservative message and the fact that they're often quite unwell and dehydrated and sick for a while before they come to hospital so how do you balance those that sort of message of conservative with resuscitating i i think that's a good point to remember i think that we Honestly, I think if we are trying to adapt our respiratory support, our mechanical ventilation, depending on, of, on trying to personalize that mechanical ventilation to each patient, we should also should be we should uh, individualize our uh, hemodynamic optimization, hemodynamic monitoring for all the patients. And I think that, as you said, there is a, a thin line between the to be very restrictive with fluid administration and to be too much giving too much fluids to our patient, it would be better to monitor the patient and try to keep to, to walk between uh, uh, over that line and trying not to be too re too restrictive and giving too much fluids. And the only way to do that, it's only monitoring the patient. Okay, and Antonio, anything different from that view? Yeah, uh, I, I agree with Ignacio. I mean, the guidelines suggest us to be conservative, implying that they just track uh, uh, the change between uh, the starting point uh, and the final effect, which should be negative balance, but actually the way to reach uh, this target uh, could be very different in, uh, in different patients. So for example, mm -hmm. we should probably tolerate some positive balance during the first days of this disease and then try to keep and to target uh, this balance as negative. Moreover, it's quite difficult to, to assess exactly which is the balance in ICU patients and, and especially in RBS patients. So uh, I would avoid a, a very strict and very uh, important restriction during the first days and then probably to target zero balance uh, during the first days and then try to be restricted after. Jack? Yes, the tendency is uh, to be very restrictive uh, sometime uh, maybe too much uh, at the beginning, but uh, I think the good way is uh, to uh, monitor uh, this patient uh, with echo and uh, with uh, continuous monitoring uh, to uh, to adapt uh, our hemodynamic strategy uh, day by day. Because I, I think whenever we get together and produce guidelines on this subject, we recognize the fact that the message is sometimes mistranslated. Nobody said don't resuscitate. They just said after you finish that process, be careful that you don't accumulate salt and water uh, every day. Do, does anyone have a view about the use of transformary thermodo, thermodilution? I mean, the use in Europe of the Swangans catheter in these patients, we've seen less of over the decades. But uh, Jack, why don't you start with that one? And any use of the transformary no. dilution techniques? Yes, I think it's a, it's a good technique and uh, it could uh, evaluate uh, lung water. Uh, so uh, it could inter be interesting in uh, this uh, patient. 
uh, to calibrate uh, uh, the free that uh, we give. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, the response is, uh, is a low response. So uh, it's interesting to see that, okay, uh, we have maybe too much uh, fluid in the lung, uh, but it's, uh, in my point of view, a little bit difficult uh, to use this as a dynamic parameters. And Jack, where do you stand bundling in with that? Uh, it's It seems as though we've taken our eye off just looking at the, the straightforward CVP, the central venous pressure, which sometimes can be very high, which is, is relevant to a, a acute kidney injury, for example. Yes. Where do you stand I with the CVP? The CVP is, uh, in this patient, it could be a very good tool uh, because uh, when we consider that uh, it's possible to have a right ventricular failure, it, it's a good uh, parameter uh, to uh, guide uh, a fluid or to guide uh, uh, if we have to give inotrop, it's uh, a good way to uh, a good tool uh, to use. So, uh, in my point of view, it's uh, in uh, some time when we combine uh, this uh, with ECHO and uh, with uh, uh, the Veda Cava, it could be very useful. Ignacio, where do you stand on pulmonary artery catheters and CVP? Well, regarding the pulmonary artery catheter, it's a, it's a useful tool. Every single monitor could be useful if you know how to use it. I mean, if you are able to understand every parameter from that monitor, you can be, you could use, you could use it with a, a good objective. I think particularly it's very helpful if you want to assess continuously the right ventricular function. And the only way to do that is using the pulmonary artery catheter. If you want to check what is the right ventricular ejection fraction continuously in that patient, the only way to do that is using the Swangans catheter. Regarding the CBP, a good friend of mine will say the CBP, the high CBP will be always pathological. I mean, uh, very high, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, the uh, high level of CBP will always, will be always an alarm. And we should do something about the high CBP. We should check if the patient has a right ventricular dysfunction if the patient has an, intra, an increase intra-abdominal pressure, if the patient has hyperbolemia, or even if the patient has a pneumothorax, for example, all those conditions will affect to the, to the venous return. Even the therapeutic intervention will be absolutely different, but always a high CBP is a signal alarm in a patient. So from my point of view, the CBP is an interesting parameter and it should be monitored only for checking the interaction between the right ventricle with the venous return. Uh, Antonio, last comments on CVP and pulmonary artery catheters? Yeah, um, I do agree with uh, both of my colleagues. Uh, um, it, to be honest, uh, we, we all know that no, more, no hemodynamic monitor, monitoring by itself uh, is going to change the outcome of our patient just because we use that. that. Uh, and, but, but it's most related to the way we use the numbers we achieve. Um, to be honest, during our uh, hot days, uh, uh, during the first, uh, first weeks uh, of uh, March, uh, we didn't have enough time to use the pulmonary artery catheter in our patients, just because we have uh, admitted a lot of patients during the same day, and we have to select the patient. We have also to select hemodynamic monitoring. So for sure, it could be useful. Uh, but uh, probably most of the numbers we have with the other less invasive uh, uh, monitorings could be useful as well. And regarding CVP, I perfectly agree with, uh, with Ignacio, is, uh, CVP is, should be low in terms of physiology. So uh, every time the CVP rises up, there should be something wrong in right ventricle fascia or in the fluid loading of our patients. So we need to be careful when we realize sudden changes in CVP in every single patient, and especially in RDS patients. Now, the, we've also got a question come in there about the de-resuscitation phase. So a lot of what's been written in recent years, wh whatever you call it, whether it's salvage optimization, stabilization, 
or, or the ROSE acronym, at the back end of it, when the patient is getting better, there's the concept of, of de-resuscitation or, or de-escalation. Antonio, do you want to start with, with that, the recovery phase? And if there's anything advanced monitors have to help with that. We don't have a, a specific uh, protocol for de-escalation. What we do every day is try to assess the fluid balance of the patient, then target uh, the fluid balance of uh, every single day, uh, trying to keep it fixed during different shifts. So for example, if we think that a patient should uh, uh, lose some fluids, then we target a negative fluid balance, and we decide which is the best strategy to achieve that. Uh, but uh, for sure, this is important in the less, latest part of uh, RDS management. Jack, uh, active de-resuscitation from, from your perspective or yes, patients, uh, just part of recovery? When the patient uh, is uh, recovered, it's, uh, first it's a slow recovery <laughs> and uh, we are very, we, are, we have to be very cautious because uh, uh, as uh, the, there is a very high risk of uh, pulmonary embolism at uh, every time uh, we can have uh, to uh, restart uh, a resuscitation or uh, we observe uh, when we hope to be on uh, the good way uh, we observe uh, uh, some uh, new uh, aggravation in this patient uh, so it's a very slow process in this disease and uh, we have to be very uh, careful about not going too fast. Ignacio, do you actively de-resuscitate? Not actually. Well, I think that we, we're, what we call uh, de-escalation or active de-escalation is actually when the patient is recovering and we are doing the right thing. I mean, if we are decreasing norepinephrine, if we are decreasing sedatives because we want to keep the patients uh, awake it's when we are doing the right things but we don't have any active uh, intervention to for doing that only it's a consequence of doing the right things but i think it's important that uh, during the not during the initial stages but the, after those days when the patient is recovering at least we should try always to keep lower the the sedation of level because that's an important key we should try to uh, avoid the use of neuromuscular blockade if the patient is, doesn't require that that therapeutic strategy, and we should always to reduce the the norepinephrine level. So that's actually not a de-escalation uh, strategy. It's only a way to do the right thing on that patient. So there's a number of questions I'm going to bundle together because we're running out of time. The so-called cytokine storm that some people have seen and where you stand on the possible use of steroids. Now, we, we know what the evidence base is with regards to steroids in what we traditionally call ARDS or sepsis. But where do you stand on if you see a cytokine storm, do you or don't you use steroids or only in the context of a trial? Ignacio, go first and then we'll go around the block. Well, Did you, have, you, we, have you seen the cytokine storms and where do you stand on steroids? We don't have experience with that. Or we don't know how to define that cytokine storm in our patient. We measure in some patients the interleukin-6, but we don't have, uh, we don't usually measure that uh, level of cytokines in all the patients. Uh, we don't recommend to use the steroids in all patients. We only use uh, the steroids as a therapeutic intervention in patients with septic shock in which the vasopress is very high. And probably, uh, and we also use the steroids at the uh, later stages of ARDS when the lung is very is stiffer. It's quite difficult to ventilate, but we should we we do not use the steroids as a measure for uh, to counteract the cytokine uh, storm. Because Antonio, there were reports early on of a subset of patients getting secondary extreme hyperpyrexias and what looked like a cytokine storm, even if cytokines weren't being measured, particularly in a younger group of patients. Did you see that? Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, some of patients uh, uh, actually have hyperpyrexia for long days, 
Um, this would be very challenging in managing uh, also because uh, some, 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 sometimes it can mask something different uh, uh, rather than the COVID infection after the first, first two weeks of ICU admission. I agree with Ignacio. I mean, uh, the history of inflammation ICU patients is quite long. In, in the past, we have a lot of interesting physiological studies uh, with a very physiological purpose, uh, which has been challenged by control, control randomized trial uh, after. So we need to be very careful in managing uh, the inflammation in this patient. Um, there are actually a lot of randomized control trial still ongoing using, for example, dexamethasone uh, as strategy. We, I think there is not still evidence to support the broad use of steroids. Uh, we don't know probably anything regarding the timing of use of these drugs uh, and the dose. So we need to be careful. For sure, some patients may, uh, for in some patients could be useful, uh, but uh, again, I, I would be more careful in using these drugs uh, so far. Jack, final comments on this subject area. Yes, there is an ongoing trial uh, trying uh, to, uh, to control or uh, to uh, manage uh, this uh, uh, inflammatory uh, state. Um, so really in the team, we are waiting for the result of this trial because I really don't know uh, what uh, we have to do concerning uh, this uh, eat of inflammation. Concerning steroid, uh, we uh, am okay with Antonio. We consider that uh, uh, there is uh, not enough proof uh, of uh, the usefulness of steroid and uh, we don't give steroid. So thank you very much indeed for your excellent contributions. Thank you to everybody who's been answering questions online. I'm sorry we didn't get to every single one of them individually, but I hope we've answered most of them for you. Thank you again to the European Society of Intensive Care Medicine for putting this on. I'm just getting a flash up there. I can see we're looking forward to seeing you in Madrid on the 10th to the 14th of October 2020. So wishing you all well. Stay safe out there and good luck with treating your patients with COVID-19. Thank you.